When you Google genetically modified organism or GMO, scary images like this one are among the first hits. But they don't really tell you anything about what GMOs actually are, so that's what we're going to do in this episode of Science in Real Life. We're going to show you how we make genetically modified plants in the lab. Spoiler alert, it doesn't involve syringes filled with mysterious rainbow chemicals. And discuss whether they're safe to eat. And we've provided a list of references on these topics and others in the description if you'd like to know more. Thompson Institute located on the campus of Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. And this is our super special guest, Assistant Professor Joyce Vanek. Hi, I'm a plant geneticist and I use genetic engineering to help improve crops to be more resistant to insects, diseases, have a higher nutritional content, and be more productive. So yes, this episode is all about genetically modified organisms or GMOs. We're going to explain the science behind GMOs and actually get to make one in the lab. We'd really like to demystify this technology for you guys. Well, first things first, what is a GMO? Well, a GMO is any organism that's had its DNA changed. And depending on what trait we want to get, we can put DNA in from a different organism, we can make more copies of a gene that's already there, or we can turn off a gene. Right, so GMOs have DNA. But so does every single organism on this planet. Bacteria, fungi, plants, humans, we all have DNA. And GMOs are no different. So why do we make GMO crops? Well, we can use GMOs to help solve some major problems in agriculture. We can increase yield, we can make crops more nutritious, and we can make them more resistant to disease and drought. But there's a lot of misunderstanding about this technology, and it's really easy to be afraid of something that we don't understand. So we're going to show you how this technology works. We're going to make a GMO in the lab right now. So today we're going to make a genetically modified tomato. We're going to make more copies of a gene that's already in the plant that will help it make more flowers and more fruit. So for this experiment, my research assistant Cynthia is going to help us out. Great, let's get started. Hi, I'm Cynthia. Today we'll be genetically modifying some tomato plants. And it's also a process called transformation. Would you like to help? Definitely. These are the plants that we will be transforming. Now we'll be cutting up some cotyledons. And cotyledons are the first leaves that a seed puts up. And we use such young plants because they're simply the best for this process. Hey guys, you ready? And all we need to do is to cut them. And you can try the next one. Okay. It's like chopping up the tiniest salad. Now that we've cut up the cotyledons, we can transform them by using agrobacteria. Agrobacterium is a bacterium that has naturally evolved a way to genetically modify plants. It's found in the soil, and when it gets into plants through their roots, it forces the plant to make all the things the agrobacterium needs to grow and be happy. It does this by transferring a tiny piece of DNA called a plasmid into the plant cell. Agrobacterium proteins then insert the plasmid into the plant's DNA, causing the plant to start producing food and housing for the bacteria. Scientists have figured out a way to harness this ability to create GMOs. So rather than putting its own DNA into the plant, we can make the agrobacterium put the DNA that we want into the plant instead. We simply give it a different plasmid, which contains genes to help the plant become drought tolerant or resistant to disease, or in this case, to produce more flowers and therefore more fruit. The agrobacterium really does all the work. So I've grown up some agrobacterium containing the plasmid. So all that cloudy stuff is the agro? Yes. Cool. And we'll be using it to transform our tissue. Exactly. So I made a solution that contains the agrobacterium. Now we toss the cotyledons right in there and shake them. <laughs> Plant transformation is happening right now. Science. I'm making a GMO right now. Exactly. <laughs> now that the cotyledons are coated with agrobacterium, we're going to put it on a plate and into an incubator for two days. And that's when the magic happens. And now they're ready. Now that the tissue has been transformed, we can move them to a medium that contains two things. The first thing is an antibiotic, which will kill off all the agrobacterium. So the agro's done its job and we don't want it hanging around anymore. Yep. The second thing is a plant hormone that will turn that tissue into an entire plant. Wow. So Plants are amazing. This is not something that only genetically modified organisms can do. All plants have the ability to regenerate a whole plant from just a little bit of tissue if they're given the right hormonal signals. 
And now that the cotyledons are on the media, we bring them to the growth chambers where they can regenerate into tomato plants. These are the cotyledons that we just transferred. And these are a later stage where you can see little plants popping up, growing up. Yep. And these are a much later stage. And now you see them rooting. Oh, it looks just like a tomato plant, because it is. So how do we know that our transformation was successful and that our tomatoes are now genetically modified? Well, we did a DNA extraction and we used PCR to check for the presence of the marker. And you can see here in these four plants, you can see the marker, but it's not in the non-GMO plant. Joyce is using the word marker to refer to a portion of our plasma DNA. These markers have unique sequences that are a sort of beacon that we can use to test if our transformation worked. So if we find the marker sequence in our tomato, we know it was successfully genetically modified. We covered DNA and PCR in season one, so check out the links to those episodes if you want to know more. And how do we know that the genetic modification is actually doing what we want it to do? We transfer the plants to the greenhouse, and after a few months, we count the number of flowers, and then several months later, we count the number of fruit. And we know it worked if the GMO plant has more flowers and fruit than the non-GMO plant. Makes so much sense. But how do we know that the genetic modification isn't also doing something that we don't want it to do? Well, we look at the plants and we make sure that the GMO plant looks exactly the same as the non-GMO plant, except for the modification that we made. And we're using this for our own basic research, but if we were making a product, it would be under evaluation by the United States Department of Agriculture and the Food and Drug Administration to make sure there were no hazards. Long before it was ever released to the public. Long before. And if I felt there was anything harmful that could come from this type of work, I wouldn't be involved in doing it, of course. So there are some common concerns that people have about GMOs, like if I eat a GMO, will it poison me or give me cancer? No, GMOs have been tested for 20 years and they've never been shown to be poisonous or cause cancer. Okay, but if I eat a GMO and the GMO has had its DNA changed, can't it change my DNA? No, because the method that we use to genetically modify an organism does not give that organism the ability to genetically modify another organism. Right. And the material that we use to genetically modify a crop is gone by the time it goes to market. As a quick reminder, we did this when we transferred the cotyledons to the media containing antibiotics. So that gets rid of the agrobacteria because they've done their job and we don't need them anymore. Sorry guys. And how is the tomato we made today part of your broader research program? Well, we hope that what we learn in tomato can be applied to other crops to increase yield, to make more food, to feed people. Great. Joyce, this was really eye-opening. I think it's so important for people to know how GMOs are made and how the technology is used and where their food comes from. Thank you so much for taking the time to explain all this to us. I was happy to help. If you want to know more about Joyce's research, you should click the link to her lab website. It's in the description. And click over here to subscribe to Science in Real Life. And don't forget to check out all of those resources in the description if you want to know more about GMOs. We'll see you next time. This episode was brought to you by the American Society of Plant Biologists, the Boyce Thompson Institute, and the European Society for Evolutionary Biology.